My name is Mary Vandenack, founder and managing partner at Vandenack Weaver LLC. I'll be your host today as we talk to experts about the issue of collaborative planning. On today's episode, I have Rob Wellendorf and Rachel Trulson as my guests. We are all are somewhat fascinated and really think it benefits clients to engage in collaborative planning. Rob is a business exit planning expert and he's the president of Executive Wealth Strategies. Rachel owns Trulson Elder Law of Nebraska. She's been particularly innovative in the life care planning space. And I have to admit to being particularly fond of the fact that Rachel and I met pretty early on in our careers, and it's been just amazing to watch what she's done in, on her career path. So welcome, Rob. Thank you. And welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Good morning. So we're going to talk today about coordinating and collaborating with other professional advisors in the interrelated areas of business exit planning and estate planning. So Rob, how do you coordinate and collaborate with business owners and their other professional advisors? Again, thank you. Yeah, I like the rule of communicate early and communicate often. And I'll say more about that. Um, oftentimes when I meet with a business owner initially, uh, we're just getting an idea or a better idea where they're going. You hear me say, let's look through the windshield initially rather than through the rear view mirror. And once we get an idea of the pathway that the business owner sees or perceives, when I mention early and often, then I think immediately uh, it makes sense, as I do, to reach out to at least the attorney or attorneys, depending on if they're a separate business uh, from estate planning, and then also the CPA oftentimes the financial advisor and the commercial lender uh, just to initiate some conversation and discussion. And I think when we reach out to the other advisors, certainly we can be brief. However, it's helpful to understand their relationship with the particular owner and or the owner's family. It's uh, important to understand the frequency that they are interacting with the owner and or the owner's family. So a lot of that background information uh, and understanding relationship uh, um, access, uh, whom they typically visit with and work with is essential when we're getting started. And isn't one of the challenges and why collaborative planning is so important is simply, and the reason I really got serious about it is that I got one too many calls where I talked to the client, then they talked to the accountant and he said, oh, Vandenek's crazy to think that, but the client might've relayed half of what I said and the accountant was busy working on something else. And so I thought, well, they're paying all of us and getting us all in the room is so important. And we see that both in the business planning arena and the estate planning arena. And Rachel, I was hoping you could just talk a little bit about what it looks like and whether it's really different in that estate planning context from the business exit planning. Right. Well, I suppose it's probably not too different. Um, we work with um, CPAs and, um, you know, life insurance and financial advisors all the time in the estate planning realm. Um, and it's really important for coordinating. Uh, when we're creating an estate plan for a client, we want to make sure that their financial assets are set up in a way that is consistent with the estate plan that we've created. Um, because if you do them separately from one another, if you don't coordinate that effort, um, it's gonna look different on the um, administration side. It's not gonna come together the way that they have planned. Um, and it's really important to include the financial advisors and the insurance people in that process so that we can all be on the same page and accomplish the client's goals. So are there any other benefits of the collaborative planning that you might want to identify? Well, I think if you are working together, like you had mentioned, there's fewer meetings. If you work directly with the financial advisors and the life insurance um, uh, and the CPA folks, then there are less mistakes that are made. You're not having a client in the middle of that conversation trying to communicate. This is what Rachel's office said to do, and then trying to convey what I had said um, to the, the financial advisor as far as beneficiary designations or account titlings. If we can communicate directly with the advisor, then there's less 
um, interpretation or misinterpretation that is made during that process, and we can get directly to the to the source and provide the information that's needed. Um, so we do have fewer meetings um, and throughout that process. Um, additionally, I think that there's um, some cost savings that's involved because you aren't having as many meetings, you're paying lesser fees because you have fewer meetings with, with a variety of different consultants. Um, and the bigger picture too, if there's some tax consequences as a result of say an inheritance that may be coming to someone in the future, or if we're dealing with an estate administration where there's a pending estate inheritance, then I always want that beneficiary to connect with their financial advisor and their tax advisor to determine whether or not there can be any income tax savings in that planning um, or in receiving that inheritance on how to receive that. Um, and that's done on the front end. You can't do tax planning after the fact. You have to do it on the front end. And so connecting that person with their financial advisor and tax advisor, um, there's some potential tax savings there too. And so one of the things I actually, one of my favorite topics that I present on is called the interference with testamentary intent via contractual transfers, right? So that failure to coordinate is somebody thinks they're giving their estate through a trust, they do a trust and it says one third, one third, one third, but then they leave a $5 million policy to one beneficiary and that beneficiary, you know, I call those distorted inheritances. So one beneficiary gets a third of the trust plus the $5 million. So you have to address that in the trust, but coordinate that. And then there's a recent case in our circuit that I've gone to including their property and casualty insurance advisor. So there is a case here where um, you, you know, there's a transfer on death deed, which isn't my favorite strategy, but a lot of people will use that. And so a client used a transfer on death, transferred his home to a niece. He died. There was no one else who lived in the house. The house was burned down by an angry ex-wife four days later. And there was no insurance coverage because the niece was not considered an insured and, the, and the, because it was a transfer on death, the deceased guy was no longer you know, an, an insured. So there was no coverage for this burned down house. And that got me to thinking about how we use beneficiary designations these days and the transfer on death deeds. And that that's something we really, as estate planners having to be addressed. So I've gone to bring in the property and casual and talk about the insurance. Can you come fill us in on the insurance coverage and what's gonna happen to these assets if there's an event, because when somebody dies, a lot of times the beneficiary doesn't even know their name yet. Rob, right. did you have any different or additional thoughts on just the benefits of the collaborative planning process? I would reinforce what Rachel said about efficiencies. I really believe you have uh, tremendous efficiencies with that type of coordination. What I would add is oftentimes, and I'm speaking directly to the business owner, Oftentimes, uh, we as professionals in a collaborative environment really need to spend some time together without you. Uh, so don't feel like you're being left out. But when we're talking about efficiencies, we, uh, we can collaborate and share and, and move towards a, a common understanding or solutions. It's not usually uh, as simple as a solution. Uh, but, but when we have all of our brains and experience together and we speak with one voice, indeed, we have efficiencies and we can help you move forward uh, because there's no secret here that the majority of, of owners, particularly in the age of baby boomers, uh, two thirds of them, as we see in many, many surveys, don't have a succession exit and coordinated estate plan. And Rob, why do you think that is? Why, why would a business owner... Right, you've built a business, you've built a good business, you're making an income from that. But then sometimes we talk about the succession and they, the owner just is like paralyzed or just can't address it. Why do you think that is? Yeah, Mary, my response would be a half day workshop. However, I'll try to be, okay. a, little, I'll, I'll try to be a little more concise. And uh, I'm speaking from over 25 years of experience in this space and I do not have one single answer. However, Think about, as we are, everyone on this particular call, we're, we're business owners. If you think about the professionals that a business owner interacts with, say, even in the last six months, uh, and we've highlighted 
of course, the attorney, the CPA, the financial advisor, the property and casualty uh, 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 professional, the commercial lender, renewing the line of credit. If we think about getting input and advice and interacting with all of these different professionals, uh, I, I think it becomes very difficult for an owner to organize the information, assimilate the information and or filter and transfer that information into how do I move forward? A lot of those discussions or conversations uh, or advice is being given almost reactively rather than proactively. So I think just recognizing what's going through the brain of the owner as they are getting peppered and none of that, none of that uh, speaks to the family dynamic as well. And if we're looking at closely held businesses that have family members involved, that adds some additional, perhaps confusion, lack of clarity, or some blurriness to how am I going to transition the business, uh, I'll be fair to my children that are not in the business. And when you start to connect all those dots, it's not so much uh, some sort of a picture that you see, it's really, I think, more of a web and it gets rather confusing to say the least. Uh, th those are just some observations on why they haven't moved forward. The other most high level would be, what's the first step? What do I do first? I climb in bed knowing that I want to be done someday, perhaps soon, but what do I do next? And so that the same thing happens in the estate planning context, right, Rachel? I've had clients where there's sometimes delays on us. We get behind and sometimes estate planning is like, okay, I've got business emergencies today, but let's say that we're really moving the process along and then you don't get, the clients don't follow up on their estate planning. What things might be going on when that happens? Well, I think sometimes they struggle um, with their own, you know, mortality. That's some of the issues I think that I see. Um, and I think too, just making decisions on um, long-term, sometimes I think they take a bigger picture, say there's too many what ifs. And I tell people, look at a period of five years. If something should happen to you within a period of five years, who would be your representatives? How would your estate be distributed? Who would you put in charge of different roles, whether it's guardians or trustees, um, financial and healthcare power of attorneys? If they look 20 years and try to determine what all the possibilities that can happen between now and 20 or 30 years from now, that's way too many decisions that have to be made and too many what ifs. So if we try to narrow that down to a shorter period of time, it is a lot easier for clients to make those decisions. Um, and so when we have that discussion in the initial meeting, if, they, if I do see that they're struggling a little bit, we do have that conversation. And then they're usually able to make those decisions knowing that, okay, we can come back in five years and reevaluate this because things will look different five years from now and we can adjust as necessary. So I think sometimes it's just looking too far in advance, too far in the future to make the decisions. So I've been recently trying this strategy with clients where I said, well, what would you want to have happen if you died tonight? And I did that with a client last week who was like, what? And, you know, it's clear he hasn't thought about death. But I'm like, it could happen. And the COVID pandemic has made me really, we have a lot of estate administrations related to the pandemic going on. And the sense of urgency actually about estate planning I saw go up at a much higher rate last year, right? But one of my favorite stories is that I had a client. So he and his wife were met. They wanted me to meet at his office and we're meeting to sign their estate planning documents. And he kept jumping up and running into the other room like every five minutes. So finally, his wife said to me, Mary, the next time he comes in here, have everything laid out and ready to sign. He can't deal with death. And that was, and that happened like early in my career and had me really aware of that, you know, what I think it was just a trust, right? That it really is, people really are, we're making them think about death, dying, taxes, and family. And that's also why I think just not the clinical piece, but the whole collaborative piece is so important, right? Um, so, you know, Rob, can you give us an example of how your collaborative process might work with the attorney, CPA, or whoever you else you involve? Sure, absolutely. 
I want to speak to listening for a moment uh, uh, with the business owner and his or her spouse, family members, you know, really listening to them about what's important. And I know that might sound simple. However, I do believe, and this is again, my experience talking oftentimes, whether it's uh, uh, the financial advisor or the CPA or the attorney, when, when we look at the family situation, maybe it's as simple as you own two different businesses, you have other assets and, uh, and based on your net worth, here's what you should do. I'm cautioning, let's listen first. Uh, let's pause, let's pump the brakes uh, um, and slow down for a moment. I think that listening and encouraging the business owner to uh, really describe how they see their life in the future, how they see their family, uh, uh, their legacy, things of that nature. Uh, first and foremost, capturing what's most important to them. We'll say their wishes, if you will. Then to your question on the collaboration, once somebody on the team has paused and listened and captured those wishes, you know, I say to the owner, the tax code is the tax code and, 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 and uh, uh, trust code is trust code. And we have uh, um, all of these tools that are available to us. However, we need to first and foremost understand in a sense, what are we building? then we can reach out to and coordinate with all of the experts in their particular space and area. And as I open with recognizing their relationship, recognizing their perspective, their lens or lenses, and collaboratively without hesitation, without doubt, because we've seen it firsthand so many times, I absolutely know we can uh, put out uh, and provide, I'll use the word, product in quotes, but a much better product as we, as we go forward that way. And if there's any sense of pause or even paralysis, I like what Rachel said in that, uh, that I want to highlight or magnify. We can be flexible in the plans and planning that we do. If you think out five years or, or somewhere beyond that slightly, we can be flexible. Uh, however, I should also mention when you sell a business, uh, I know we're getting back to traveling now uh, and, and renting cars. I picture driving that car back into the rental place with those spikes <laughs> and it's a one way you're in, you can't back up. So I want to be cautious when I say we can be flexible, uh, but, but if we isolate selling your business, uh, uh, that is a one way a one-way street. I love, Rob, what you said about the listening piece. I think that one of the things I do see um, with professionals sometimes is that they jump to what they know or they make the assumptions sometimes about what the client wants. So I have gone to a process where I do what I call objective-based planning, and I just start like, well, what are your objectives? And it's amazing how often I ask that question. They're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, so I actually have a list of potential objectives. And I said, well, let's talk about, you know, and to me, some people start with the tax planning and tax savings. And there are some clients that just save me taxes no matter what. But most people care a lot about how their assets are going to be disposed of, how they're, you know, what's going to happen post their business exit, things like that. So I really call it like objective-based planning, just using a different term. And what I do is after I have that conversation with them, I actually put it in writing and I send it out to them and say, this is what I heard. Can you confirm it? And sometimes the answer is yes. I was like, I said that, you know, but so if it, you get that I said that reaction, then that tells me, wow, I really need to uh, revisit this conversation and see where these guys are coming from. In the in estate planning, which is a little bit different in the collaboration and from uh, the business exit planning, Rachel, are there any other examples that you might want to give of that process that you use? Um, yeah, we do that. Um, as far as trust funding, when we were doing estate planning, um, we utilize our financial advisors quite a bit when we are 
funding the trust um, and retitling assets. Um, we also use the uh, financial advisors to confirm our beneficiary designations. Like I alluded to earlier, if we have um, an estate plan set up and inconsistent beneficiary designations, that's not going to accomplish our client's goals. So we want to make sure that everybody's on the same page with that. And we work directly with the financial advisors or the life insurance um, agents in order to make that happen. Um, one of the things that I do see when I plan for young families is that they are underinsured from a life insurance standpoint. So we try to encourage them to reach out to their um, insurance agents to secure the proper amount of life insurance coverage to plan in the event something should happen to um, either the, the primary breadwinning spouse or, or the, the mom that tends to want to wanna stay at home with the kids. Um, and they tend to not um, provide ad ad adequate coverage for, for those circumstances. So that's really important. So we try to encourage them to do that. Um, as people age and get near retirement, we look at the estate plan a little differently. Um, as far as life insurance is concerned, we consider long-term care insurance options also, whether or not that's a possibility for them, or if they do have old life insurance policies, for example, that we might be able to convert some cash value for uh, long-term care insurance. So we have that discussion. Um, and then also just plain asset protection planning. So as we age and, and near retirement, if we don't have long-term care insurance, um, we look at the bigger picture on how maybe we can plan for asset protection. And we reach out to um, life insurance agents, financial advisors, um, and even their tax advisors to determine how best can we plan for these folks um, as they reach retirement and maybe need to plan for those long-term care costs. And it's just instrumental that we reach out to all those different types of advisors and figure out the plan that might be best suited for them. And as I move to a collaborative model, one of the things that I really try and do is, and actually I'm insistent on it. I personally no longer represent clients that won't engage in collaborative planning because I think it's just so important. I've actually gone to a meeting model where not every client needs an annual meeting, a lot do. And I actually have some that, I have one group where we set up a family trust company. So we're doing quarterly meetings and finding that we're having trouble covering ground with just quarterly meetings. Some are annual. Sometimes I look at the file, send out a note and say, I don't really think you need an annual meeting this year, but nine times out of 10, they'll say, oh yeah, no, I need to fill you in on what happened. So I found that, and what I try and do is get all of the advisors in the same room at a time that makes sense. So you don't want to call, bring in the accountant in the middle of March, right? That's like just, so we'll do a lot of that pre-year end trying to, you know, doing some tax planning as well. But can I, each of you, as we move towards the end, I'll just ask Rob first to kind of share one or two main observations that you've made in working with the closely held business owners over the years. Sure. I had referenced the statistics. I don't like to use a lot of statistics, but uh, we as professionals understand that the majority of closely held business owners have not addressed, organized, and, and prepared their succession transition um, uh, estate plan. So, so in recognizing that, I guess I would mention you're not alone. That is about two thirds of the boomers. Uh, and we also recognize as we line up the financial and the emotional aspects of, of that time when you're no longer done, I do believe and reinforce uh, the old pump the brakes. Let's, let's do it well. Let's do it right. We'll build in flexibility. And if I may, I want to speak to fees just for a moment. We talked earlier about efficiencies and we all strongly believe with collaborative planning and communication we have tremendous efficiencies. I read a little booklet, oh gosh, 15 years ago by the CPA, Christopher Mercer, called The 1% Solution. And he talks about if it's acceptable for a financial advisor to charge, say, 1% to manage your money, um, you know, and Mr. or Mrs. Business Owner, typically your largest asset is your business. So, if you're paying adv an advisor to manage your, your liquid investable assets, uh, don't think it's unreasonable to consider 
paying fees to, to a collaborative professional team to really take care of oftentimes your biggest asset, that is your business. So we want to be encouraging, of course, uh, and also just trust the professionals in the process. We all have processes and we all have experience. Um, and together, we will, again, provide a, a really strong solution, solutions for you and your family. Thanks, Rob. And Rachel, so do you have any final observations that you would like to add? Um, I think probably one thing is just to encourage people um, to get their estate planning if there's an order. And that just goes without saying. And I think a lot of people, when they're hesitant about it because they don't know what that first step looks like, like Rob had indicated earlier, what does that first step look like? Um, and they don't have to know all of the answers. And that's why they're coming to the professional and to be open to collaborative planning, um, to share information with their financial advisors. And when we sit down at that first meeting, we ask them specifically, who can we reach out to? Can we reach out to your financial advisor, your insurance agent? Um, and we get all of that in, in our retainer agreement so that we have that um, permission to disclose information and to reach out. Um, and that is almost always well received. They usually don't want to be in the middle of that. They want us to do that communication. So I think it's just reaching out to people and letting them know that it's important to get started with the process. They don't have to know all the answers and to be open to that process. I think the process on taking care of the business, I think that's a great point, Rob, on the value of the business. I hadn't heard that analogy before. And the estate planning, I mean, we've all had somebody pass away who didn't do their planning, and it's just really a challenge. Well, I want to thank both of you for joining me today.